Part 4, Chapter 21 of The Marriage of William Ashe by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4, Chapter 21 Kitty fell back in silence, staring at William. She loosened her mantle and threw it off. Then she sat down in a chair near the wood fire and bent over it, shivering. Of course you didn't mean that, William, she said at last. Ash turned. I should not have said it unless I had meant every word of it. It is, of course, the only thing to be done. Kitty looked at him miserably. But you can't mean that, that you'll resign because of that book. She pulled it towards her and turned over the pages with a hand that trembled. That would be too foolish. Ash made no reply. He was standing before the fire with his hands in his pockets and a face half absent, half ironical as though his mind followed the sequences of a far distant future. William, she caught the sleeve of his coat with a little cry. I wrote that book because I thought it would help you. His attention came back to her. Yes, Kitty, I believe you did. She gulped down a sob. His tone was so odd, so remote. Many people have done such things. I know they have. Why, why, it was only meant as a skit to, to make people laugh. There's no harm in it, William. Ash, without speaking, took up the book and looked back at certain pages which he seemed to have marked. Kitty's feeling as she watched him was the feeling of the condemned culprit, held dumb and strangled in the grip of his own sense of justice, and yet passionately conscious how much more he could say for himself than anybody is ever likely to say for him. When did you have the first idea of this book, Kitty? About a year ago, she said in a low voice. In October, at Haggard? Kitty nodded. Ash thought. Her admission took him back to the autumn weeks at Haggard, after the cliff crisis and the rearrangement of the ministry in the July of that year. He well remembered that those weeks had been weeks of special happiness for both of them. Afterwards, the winter had brought many renewed qualms and vexations. But in that period, between the storms of the session and Kitty's escapades in the hunting field, memory recalled a tender, melting time, a time rich in hidden and exquisite hours, when, with Kitty on his breast, lip to lip and heart to heart, he had reaped, as it seemed to him, the fruits of that indulgence which, as he knew, his mother scorned. And at that very moment, behind his back, out of sight, she had begun this atrocious thing. He looked at her again, the bitterness almost at his lips, almost beyond his control. I wish I knew what could have been your possible object in writing it. She sat up and confronted him. The colour flamed back again into her pale cheeks. You know, I told you, when we had that talk in London that I wanted to write, I thought it would be good for me, would take my thoughts off, well, what had happened. And I began to write this, and it amused me to find I could do it. And I suppose I got carried away. I loved describing you and glorifying you, and I loved making caricatures of Lady Parham and all the people I hated. I used to work at it whenever you were away, or I was down and there was nothing to do. Did it never occur to you, said Ash, interrupting, that it might get you, get us both, into trouble and that you ought to tell me? She wavered. No, she said at last. I never did mean to tell you while I was writing it. You know I don't tell lies, William. The real fact is, I was afraid you'd stop it. Good God! He threw up his hands with a sound of amazement, then thrust them again into his pockets, and began to pace up and down. But then, she resumed, I thought you'd soon get over it, and that it was funny, and everybody would laugh, and you'd laugh, and there would be an end of it. He turned and stared at her. Frankly, Kitty, I don't understand what you can be made of. You imagined that that sketch of Lord Parham he struck the open page, a sketch written by my wife, describing my official chief, when he was my guest, under my own roof, with all sorts of details of the most intimate and offensive kind, mocking his speech, his manners, his little personal ways, charging him with being the corrupt tool of Lady Parham, disloyal to his colleagues, a man not to be trusted, and justifying all this by a sort of evidence that you could only have got as my wife and Lord Parham's hostess. You actually suppose that you could write and publish that? without in the first place it's been plain to every Tom, Dick and Harry that you had written it. And in the next, 
without making it impossible for your husband to remain a colleague of the man you treat in such a way. Kitty, you are not a stupid woman. Do you really mean to say that you could write and publish this book without knowing that you were doing a wrong action? Which, so far from serving me, could only damage my career irreparably? Did nothing, did no one warn you, if you were determined to keep such a secret from your husband, whom it most concerned? He come to stand beside her, both hands on the back of the chair, stooping forward to emphasise his words, the lines of his fine face and noble brow contracted by anger and pain. Mr. Darrell warned me, said Kitty in a low voice, as though those imperious eyes compelled the truth from her. But of course I, I didn't believe him. Darrell, cried Ash and Daisbert. Darrell, you confided in him? I told him all about it. It was he who took it to a publisher. Hound, said Ash between his teeth. So that was his revenge. Oh, you needn't blame him too much, said Kitty, proudly, not understanding the remark. He wrote to me not long ago to say it was horribly unwise, and that he washed his hands of it. Ay, when he'd done the deed. When did you show it him? said Ash impetuously. At Haggart, in August. Et tu brute, said Ash, turning away. Well, that's done with. Now the only thing to do is to face the music. I go home. Whatever can be done to withdraw the book from circulation, I shall of course do. But I gather from this precious letter held up the note which had been enclosed in the parcel, that some thousands of copies have already been ordered by the booksellers, and a few distributed to persons in high places. William, she said in despair, catching his arm again, listen, I offer the man two hundred pounds only yesterday to stop it. Ash laughed. What did he reply? He said it was impossible fifty copies had already been issued. The review copies, no doubt. By next week there will be, I should say, five thousand in the shops. Your man understands his business, Kitty. This is the kind of puff preliminary he has been scattering about. With his sparkling eyes, he handed to her a printed slip containing an outline of the book with the information of the booksellers. It drew attention to the extraordinary interest of the production as a painting of the upper class by the hand of one belonging to its inmost circle. People of the highest social and political importance will be recognised at once. The writer handles cabinet ministers and their wives with equal freedom, and with a touch betraying the closest and most intimate knowledge. Details hitherto quite unknown to the public of ministerial combinations and intrigues, especially of the feminine influences involved, will be found there in their lightest and most amusing form. A certain famous fancy bull will be identified without difficulty. Scathing as some of the portraits are, the writer is by no means merely cynical. The central figure of the book is a young and rising statesman whose aim and hopes are touched with a loving hand. The charm of the portrait being only equalled by the venom with which the writer assails those who have thwarted or injured his hero. But our advice is simply, buy and read. The conjecture will run wild about the writer. All we can say is that the most romantic or interesting surmise that can possibly be formed will fall far short of the reality. The beast is a shrewd beast, said Ash, as he raised himself from the stooping position in which he had been following the sentences over Kitty's shoulder. He knows that the plumping will rush for his wares. How much money did he offer you, Kitty? He turned sharply on his heel to wait for her reply. A hundred pounds, said Kitty, almost inaudibly. And a hundred more if five thousand sold. She had returned again to her crouching attitude over the fire. Generous, upon my word, said Ash, scornfully turning over the two thickly, loosely printed, moody volumes. A guinea to the public, I suppose. Fifteen shillings to the trade. Darrell didn't exactly advise you to advantage, Kitty. Kitty kept silent. The sarcastic violence of his tone fell on her like a blow. She seemed to shrink together, while Ash resumed his walk to and fro. Presently, however, she looked up to ask, in a voice that tried for steadiness, What do you mean to do exactly, William? I shall, of course, buy up all I can. I shall employ some loyal fellow and appeal to the good feelings of the newspapers. There'll be no trouble with the respectable ones. But some copies will get out, and some of the opposition newspapers will make capital out of them. Naturally, they'd be precious fools if they didn't. A momentary hope sprang up in Kitty. 
But if you buy it up and stop all the papers that matter, she faltered, why should you resign, William? There won't be such great harm done. For answer, he opened the book, and without speaking, pointed to two passages. The first, an account full of point and malice, of the negotiations between himself and Lord Parham at the time when he entered the cabinet, the conditions he himself had made, and the confidential comments of the Premier on the men and affairs of the moment. Do you remember the night when I told you those things, Kitty? Yes, Kitty remembered them well. It was a night of intimate talk between man and wife, a night when she had shown him her sweetest, tenderest mood, and he, the incorrigible optimist, had persuaded himself that she was growing as wise as she was lovely. Her lip trembled. Then he pointed to the second, to the pitiless picture of Lord Parham at Haggart. You wrote that when he was under our roof, there by our pressing invitation. You couldn't have written it unless he had so put himself in your power. A wandering Arab kitty will do no harm to the man who has eaten and drunk in his tent. She looked up, and as she read his face, she understood at last how what she had done had outraged in him all the natural and all the inherited instincts of a generous and fastidious nature. The great gentleman, so strong in him as in all the best of English statesmen, whether they spring from the classes or the masses, was up in arms. She sprang to her feet with a cry. William, you can't give up politics. It would make you miserable. That can't be helped. And I couldn't go on like this, Kitty, even if this affair of the book could be patched up. The strain's too great. They were but a yard apart, and yet she seemed to be looking at him across a gulf. You've been so happy in your work. This time the sob escaped her. Oh, don't let's talk about that, he said abruptly as he walked away. There'll be a certain relief in giving up the impossible. I'll go back to my books. We could travel, I suppose, and put politics out of our heads. But you won't resign your seat? No, he said after a pause. No, as far as I can see at present, I shan't resign my seat, though my constituents, of course, will be very sick but I doubt whether I shall stand again. Every phrase fell as though with a thud on Kitty's ear. It was the wreck of a man's life, and she had done it. Shall you, shall you go and see Lord Parham? she asked after a pause. I shall write to him first. I imagine, he pointed to the letter lying on the table, that creature has already said to the book. Then later, I dare say, I shall see him. She looked up. If I wrote and told him it was all my doing, William, if I grovelled to him? The responsibility is mine, he said sternly. I had no business to tell even you the things printed there. I told them at my own risk. If anything I say has any weight with you, Kitty, you will write nothing. She spread out her hands to the fire again. And he heard her say, as though to herself, The thing is, the awful thing is, that I'm mad. I, I must be mad. I, I never thought of all this when I was writing it. I, I wrote it in a kind of dream. In the first place, I, I wanted to glorify you. He broke into an exclamation. Your taste, Kitty. Where was your taste? That a wife should praise a husband in public, you, you could only make us both laughing stocks. His handsome features quivered a little. He felt this part of it the most galling, the most humiliating of all, and she understood. In his eyes she had shown herself not only reckless and treacherous, but indelicate, vulgar, capable of besperching the most sacred and intimate of relations. She rose from her seat. I must go and take my things off, she said in a vague voice, and as she moved she tottered a little. He turned to look at her. Amid his own crushing sense of defeat and catastrophe, his natural and righteous indignation, he remembered that she had been ill. He remembered their child. But whether from the excitement, first of the meeting in the Vercelli Palace, and now of this scene, or merely from the heat of the fire over which she had been hanging, her cheeks were flushed, her eyes blazed. Her beauty had never been more evident. 
but it made little appeal to him. It was the wild, ungovernable beauty from which he had suffered. He saw that she was excited, but there was an air of also of returning physical vigour, and the nascent feeling which might have been strengthened by pallor and prostration died away. Kitty moved as though to pass him and go to her room, which opened out of the salon. But as she neared him, she suddenly caught him by the arm. William, William, don't do it. Don't resign. Let me apologise. He was angered by her persistence, and merely said coldly, I've given you my reasons, Kitty, why such a course is impossible. And, and you start tomorrow morning? By the early train. Please let me go, Kitty. There are many things to arrange. I must order the gondola and see if the people here can cash me a cheque. You mean to leave me alone? The words had a curious emphasis. I had a few words with Miss French before you came in. The packet arrived by the evening post, and seeing that it was books for you, I opened it. After about an hour, he turned and walked away again. I saw my bearings. Then I called Miss French, told her I should have to go tomorrow, and asked her how long she could stay with you. William, cried Kitty again, leaning heavily on the table beside her. Don't go. Don't leave me. His face darkened. So you would prevent me from taking the only honourable, the only decent way out of this thing that remains to me? He made no immediate reply. She stood, wrapped apparently in painful abstraction, a creature lovely and distraught. The masses of her fair hair loosened by the breeze on the canal had fallen about her cheeks and shoulders. Her black hat framed the white brow and large feverish eyes, and the sable cape she had worn in the gondola had slipped down over the thin, sloping shoulders, revealing the young figure and the slender waist. She might have been a child of seventeen, grieving over the death of her goldfinch. Ash gathered together his official letters and papers, found his cheque-book, and began to write. While he wrote, he explained that Miss French could keep her company at least another fortnight, that he could leave with them four or five circular notes for immediate expenses, and would send more from home directly he arrived. In the middle of his directions, Kitty once more appealed to him in a passionate, muffled voice not to go. This time he lost his temper, and without answering her, he hastily left the room to arrange his packing with his valet. When he returned to the salon, Kitty was not there. He and Miss French, who knew only that something tragic had happened in which Kitty was concerned, kept up a fragmentary conversation till dinner was announced and Kitty entered. She had evidently been weeping, but with powder and rouge she had tried to conceal the traces of her tears, and at dinner she sat silent, hardly answering when Margaret French spoke to her. After dinner, Ash went out with his cigar towards the piazza. He was in a smarting, dazed state, beginning, however, to realise the blow more than he had done at first. He believed that Parham himself would not be at all sorry to be rid of him. He and his friends formed a powerful group, both in the cabinet and out of it. But they were forcing the pace, and the elements of resistance and reaction were strong. He pictured the dismay of his friends, the possible breakdown of the reforming party. Of course they might so stand by him, and the suppression of the book might be so complete. At this moment he caught sight of a newspaper contents bill displayed at the door of the only shop in the piazza which sold English newspapers. One of the lines ran, Anonymous attack on the Premier. He started, went in, and bought the paper. There, in the London Topics column, was the following paragraph. A string of extracts from our forthcoming book, accompanied by a somewhat startling publisher statement, has lately been sent round to the press. We are asked not to print them before the day of publication, but they have already roused much attention, if not excitement. They certainly contain a very gross attack on the Prime Minister, based apparently on first-hand information, and involving indiscretions, personal and political, of an unusually serious character. The wife of a cabinet minister is freely named as the writer, and, even if no violation of cabinet secrecy is concerned, it is clear that the book outrages the confidential relations which ought to subsist between a premier and his colleagues, if government on our English system is to be satisfactorily carried on. 
the statements it makes with every appearance of authority, both as to the relations between Lord Parham and some of the more important members of his cabinet, and as to the Premier's intentions with regard to one or two of the most vital questions now before the country, are calculated seriously to embarrass the government. We fear the book will have a veritable success de scandal. That fellow at least has done his best to kick the ball, damn him, thought Ash with contempt as he thrust the paper into his pocket. It was no more than he expected, but it put an end to all forms of a more hopeful kind. He walked up and down the piazza smoking till midnight, counting the hours till he could reach a London and revolving the phrases of a telegram to be sent to his solicitor before starting. Kitty made no sign or sound when he entered her room. Her fair head was turned away from him, and all was dark. He could hardly believe that she was asleep, but it was a relief to him to accept her pretense of it, and to escape all further conversation. He himself slept but little. The mere profundity of the Venetian silence teased him. It reminded him how far he was from home. Two images pursued him, of Kitty writing the book, while he was away lectioneering or toiling at his new office, and then of his returns to Haggart, tired or triumphant on many a winter evening, of her glad rush into his arms, her sparkling face on his breast. Or again he conjured up the scene when the manuscript had been shown to Darrell, his pretense of disapproval, his sham warnings, and the smile on his sallow face as he walked off with it. Ash looked back to the early days of his friendship with Darrell, when he, Ash, was one of the leaders at Eton, popular with the masters in spite of his incorrigible idleness, and popular with the boys because of his bodily prowess. And Darrell had been a small, sickly, bullied colleger. Scene after scene recurred to him, from their later relations at Oxford also. There was a kind of deliberation in the way in which he forced his thoughts into this channel, made an outlet for a fierce bitterness of spirit, which some imperious instinct forbade him to spend on Kitty. He dozed in the later hours of the night, and was roused by something touching his hand which lay outside the bedclothes. Again the little head and the soft curls. Kitty was there, crouched beside him, weeping. There flashed into his mind an image of the night in London when she had come to him thus, and, unwelcome as the whole remembrance was, he was conscious of a sudden swelling wave of pity and passion. What if he sprang up, caught her in his arms, forgave her, and bade the world go hang? No, the impulse passed, and in his turn he feigned sleep. The thought of her long deceit, of the selfish wilfulness wherewith she had requited deep love and easy trust, was too much. It seared his heart and there was another and a subtler influence. To have forgiven so easily would have seemed treachery to those high ambitions and ideals from which, as he thought any too certainly, she had now cut him off. It was part of his surviving youth that the catastrophe seemed to him so absolute. Any thought of the fresh efforts which would be necessary for the reconquering of his position was no less sickening to him than that of the immediate discomforts and humiliations to be undergone. He would go back to books and amusement, and in the idling of the future there would be plenty of time for love-making. In the morning, when all preparations were made, the gondoliers waiting below, Ash's telegram sent, and the circular notes handed over to Margaret French, who had discreetly left the room, William approached his wife. Goodbye, said Kitty, and gave him her hand with a strange look and smile. Ash, however, drew her to him and kissed her, against her will. "'I'll do my best, Kitty,' he said in a would-be cheery voice, "'to put us through. Perhaps, I don't know, things may turn out better than I think. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. All right, of course. But don't hurry home. You'll want a fortnight or three weeks yet.' Kitty said not a word, and in another minute he was gone. The Italian servants congregated below at the water gate sent laughing, Arrivederlas, after the handsome, good-tempered Englishman whom they liked and regretted. The gondola moved off. Kitty heard the plash of the water. 
but she held back from the window. Halfway to the bend of the canal beyond the Academia, Ash turned and gave a long look at the balcony. No one was there. But just as the gondola was passing out of sight, Kitty slipped onto the balcony. She could see only the figure of Piero, the gondolier, and in another second the boat was gone. She stayed there for many minutes, clinging to the balustrade and staring, as it seemed, at the sparkling of autumnal sun which danced on the green water and on the red palace to her right. All the morning, Kitty on her sofa pretended to, to write letters. Margaret French, working or reading behind her, knew that she scarcely got through a single note, that her pen lay idle on the paper, while her eyes absently watched the palace windows on the other side of the canal. Miss French was quite certain that some tragic cause of difference between the husband and wife had arisen. Kitty, the indiscreet, had for once kept her own counsel about the book, and Ash had with his own hands packed away the volumes which had arrived the night before, so that she could only guess, and from that delicacy of feeling restrained her as much as possible. Once or twice, Kitty seemed on the point of unburdening herself. The overmastering tears would threaten she would break off and begin to write. At luncheon, her look alarmed Miss French, so white was the little face, so large and restless the eyes. Ought Mr. Ash to have left her, and left her apparently in, in anger? No doubt he thought her much better. But Margaret remembered the worst days of her illness, the anxious looks of the doctors, and the anguish that Kitty had suffered in the first weeks after her child's death. She seemed now, indeed, to have forgotten little Harry, so far as outward expression went. But who could tell what was passing in her strange, unstable mind? And it often seemed to Margaret that the signs of the past summer were stamped on her indelibly, for those who had eyes to see. Was it the perception of this pity beside her that drove Kitty to solitude and flight? At any rate, she said after luncheon that she would go to Madame Destre, and did not ask Miss French to accompany her. She set out accordingly with the two gondoliers, but she had hardly passed the Academia before she bid her men take a cross-cut to the Giudecia. On these wide waters, with the fresher air and full of sunshine, a certain physical comfort seemed to breathe upon her. Piero, it is not rough. Can we go to the Lido? She asked the gondolier behind her. Piero, who was all smiles and complacence, as well he might be with the lady who scattered Lira as freely as Kitty did, turned the boat at once for that channel del Orfano, where the bones of the vanquished dead lie deep amid the ooze. They passed San Giorgio, and was soon among the piles and sandbanks of the lagoon. Kitty sat in a dream which blotted the sunshine from the water. It seemed to her that she was a dead creature, floating in a dead world. William had ceased to love her. She had wrecked his career and destroyed her own happiness. A child had been taken from her. Lady Trammell's affection had long since been alienated. Her own mother was nothing to her, and her friends in society, like Madeleine Alcott, would only laugh and gloat over the scandal of the book. Now everything was finished. As her fingers hanging over the side of the gondola felt the touch of the water, her morbid fancy, incredibly quick and keen, fancied herself drowned or poisoned, lying somehow white and cold on a bed where William might see and forgive her. Then with a the start of memory it brought the blood rushing to her face, she thought of Cliff, standing beside the door of the great hall of the Vercelli Palace. She seemed to be looking again into those deep, expressive eyes, held by the irony and the passion with which they were infused. Had the passion any reference to her? Or was it merely part of the man's nature, as inseparable from it as flame from the volcano? If William had cast her off, was there still one man, wild and bad indeed like herself, but poet and hero nevertheless, who loved her? She did not much believe it, but still the possibility of it lured her, like some dark gulf that promised her oblivion from this pain, pain which tortured one so impatient of distress, so hungry for pleasure and praise. In those days, 
the Nudo was still a noble and solitary shore, without the degradations of today. Kitty walked fast and furiously across the sandy road and over the shingles, turning, when she reached the firm sand, southward toward Malamocho. It was between four and five, and the autumn afternoon was fast declining. A fresh breeze was on the sea, and the short waves, intensely blue under a wide, clear heaven, broke in dazzling foam on the red-brown sand. She seemed to be alone between sea and sky, save for two figures approaching from the south, a fisher-boy with a shrimping net, and a man walking bareheaded. She noticed them idly. A mirage of sun was between her and them, and the agony of remorse and despair which held her blunted all perceptions. Thus it was that not till she was close upon him did her dazzled sight recognise Geoffrey Cliff. He saw her first and stopped in motionless astonishment on the edge of the sand. She almost ran against him when his voice arrested her. Lady Kitty! She put her hand to her breast, wavered, and came to a standstill. He saw a little figure in black between him and those gorgeous towers and cloud-capped palaces of alpine snow which dimly closed in the north. And beneath the drooping hat, a face even more changed and tragic than that which had haunted him since their meeting of the day before. How do you do? she said mechanically, and would have passed him, but he stood in her path. As he stared at her, an impulse of rage ran through him, resenting the wreck of anything so beautiful. Rage against Ash, who must surely be somehow responsible. Aren't you wandering too far, Lady Kitty? His voice shook under the restraint he put upon it. You seem tired, very tired, and you're perhaps farther from your gondola than you think. I am not tired, he hesitated. Might I walk with you a little, or do you forbid me? She said nothing but walked on. He turned and accompanied her. One or two questions that he put to her, had she companions, where had she left her gondola, remained unanswered. He studied her face, and at last he laid a strong hand upon her arm. Sit down, you are not fit for any more walking. He drew her towards some logs of driftwood on the upper sand, and she sank down upon them. He found a place beside her. What is the matter with you? he said abruptly with a harsh authority. You are in trouble. Tremor shook her, as of the prisoner who feels on his limbs the first touch of the fetter. No, no, she said, trying to rise. It is nothing. I I didn't labour so far. I, I must go home. His hand held her. Kitty. Yes? Her voice was scarcely audible. Tell me what hurts you. Tell me why you are here, alone, with a face like that. Don't be afraid of me. Could I lift a finger to harm a mother that has lost her child? Give me your hands. He gathered both hers into the warm shelter of his own. Look at me. Trust me. My heart has grown, Kitty, since you knew me last. It has taken it to itself so many griefs, so many deaths. Tell me your griefs, poor child. Tell me. He stooped kissed her hands, most tenderly, most gravely. Tears rushed into her eyes. The wild emotions of her being were roused beyond control. Bending towards him, she began to pour out, first brokenly, then in a torrent, a wretched, incoherent story, of which the mere telling in such an ear meant new treachery to William, and new ruin for herself. End of Part 4, Chapter 21。f o u r Chapter 22 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4, Chapter 22. On a certain cloudy afternoon, some ten days later, a fishing boat with a patched orange sail might have been seen scudding under a light northwesterly breeze through the channels which connect the island of San Francisco with the more easterly stretches of the Venetian lagoon. The boat presently neared the shore of one of the cultivated Lidi, 
islands formed out of the silt of many rivers by the travail of centuries, some of them still mere sand or mud banks, others covered by vineyards and fruit orchards, which, with the Murazzi or sea walls of Venice, stand sentinel between the city and the sea. On the Lido, along which the boat was coasting, the vintage was long since over and the fruit gathered. The last yellow and purple leaves in the orchards, a pestilence-stricken multitude, were today falling fast to earth under the sighing, importunate wind. The air was warm. November was at its mildest. But all colour and light were drowned in floating mists, and darkness lay over the distant city. It was one of those drear and ghostly days which may well have breathed into the soul of Shelley that superb vision of the dead generations of Venice, rising, a phantom host from the bosom of the sunset, and sweeping in a rapid mask of death over the shadowed waters that saw the birth, and may yet furnish the tomb, of so vast a fame. Two persons were in the boat. Kitty, wrapped in sables, her straying hair held close by a cap of the same fur, and Geoffrey Cliff. They had been wandering in the lagoons all day, in order to escape from Venice and observers, first at Torcello, then at San Francesco, and now they were ostensibly coming home in a wide sweep along the northern Lidi and Murazzi, that Cliff might show his companion from nearby the Porto del Lido that exits from the lagoons where the salt lakes grow into the sea. A certain wildness and exultation, drawn from the solitudes around them and from their tete-a-tete, -tete, could be read in both the man and the woman. Cliff watched his companion incessantly. As he lay against the side of the boat at her feet, he saw her framed in the curving sides of the stern and could read her changing expressions. Not a happy face, that he knew. A face haunted by shadows from an underworld of thought, pursuing furies of remorse and fear. Not the less did he triumph that he had it there in his power, nor had the flashes of terror and wavering will which he discerned in any way diminished its beauty. "'How long have you known that woman?' Kitty asked him suddenly, after a pause broken only by the playing of the wind with the sail. Cliff laughed. "'Then, Richie, why do you want to know, madame?' She made a contemptuous lip. "'I knew her first, said Cliff, some years ago in Milan. She was then at La Scala, walking on, paying for her good looks. Then somebody sent her to Paris, to the Conservatoire, which she only left this spring. This is her first Italian engagement. Her people are shopkeepers here, in the Maceria, which helped her. She is as vain as a peacock and as dangerous as a pet panther.' Dangerous? Kitty's scorn had passed into her voice. Well, Italy is still the country of the knife, said Cliff lightly, and I could still hire a bravo or two in Venice if I wanted them. Does the Ritchie hire them? Cliff shrugged his shoulders. She'll do it without winking if it suited her. Then, after a pause, do you still wonder why I should have chosen her society? Oh, no, said Kitty hastily. You told me. "'As much as a friend cares to know?' "'She nodded, flushing, and dropped the subject. "'Cliff's mouth still smiled, "'but his eyes studied her with a veiled and sinister intensity. "'I have not seen the lady for a week,' he resumed. "'She pesters me with notes. "'I promised to go and see her in her new play tomorrow night, but... "'Oh, go,' said Kitty. "'By all means, go. "'Reblas in Italian? I think not. "'Ha!' Did you see that gleam on the campanile? Marvellous. Milady, I have a question to ask you. Details, said Kitty. Did you put me into your book? Certainly. What kind of things did you say? The worst I could. Ha! How should I get a copy? said Cliff, musing. She made no answer, but she was conscious of a sudden movement. Was it of terror? At the bottom of her soul, was she indeed afraid of the man beside her? By the way, he resumed, you promised to tell me your news of this morning, but you haven't told me a word. She turned away. She had gathered her furs around her, and her face was almost hidden by them. Nothing is settled, she said in a cold, reluctant voice. Which means that you won't tell me anything more? She was silent. Her lip had a proud line which piqued him. 
You think I am not worthy to know? Her eye gleamed. What does it matter to you? No, nothing. I should have been glad to hear that all was well, and Ash's mind at rest about his prospects. His prospects? she repeated with a scorn which stung. How dare we mention his name here at all? Cliff reddened. I dare, he said calmly. Kitty looked at him, a quivering defiance in face and frame, then bent forward. Would you like to know who is the best, the noblest, the handsomest, the most generous, the most delightful man I have ever met? Each word came out winged and charged with a strange intensity of passion. Do I? said Cliff, raising his eyebrows. Do I want to know? Her look held him. My husband, William Ash. And she fell back, flushed and breathless, like one who throws out a rebel and challenging flag. Cliff was silent a moment, observing her. Strange, he said at last. It is only when you are miserable you are kind. I could wish you miserable again, Sherry. Tone and look broke into a sombre wildness before which she shrank. Her own violence passed away. She leaned over the side of the boat, struggling with tears. Can you have your wish? was her muffled answer. The three bronze Venetians, a father and two sons, who were working the Bragozzo, glanced curiously at the pair. They were persuaded that these charters of their boat were lovers flying from observation, and the unknown tongue did but stimulate guessing. Cliff raised himself impatiently. They were nearing a point where the line of Murazzi they had been following, low breakwaters of great strength, swept away from them outward and eastward towards a distant opening. On the other side of the channel was a low line of shore broadening into the Lido proper, with its scattered houses and churches, and soon lost in the mist as it stretched towards the south. Ecco il porto del Lido, said the older boatman, pointing far away to a line of deeper colour beneath a dark and lowering sky. Kitty bent over the side of the boat, staring towards the dim spot he showed her, where was the mouth of the sea. Kitty, said Cliff's voice beside her, hoarse and hurried, one word and I'll tell these fellows to set their helm for Trieste. This boat will carry us well, and the wind is with us. She turned and looked him in the face. And then? Then we'll think it out together, Kitty. Together. He bent his lips to her hand, bending so as to conceal the action from the sailors. But she drew her hand away. You and I, she said fiercely, would tire of each other in a week. Have the courage to try. No, you should not tire of me in a week. I would find ways to keep you mine, Kitty, cradled and comforted and happy. Happy? Her slight laugh was the forlornest thing. Take me out to sea and drop me there with a stone round my neck. That might be worth doing, perhaps. He surveyed her, unmoved. Listen, Kitty, this kind of thing can't go on forever. What are you waiting for? She said tauntingly. You ought to have gone last week. I am not going, he said, raising himself by a sudden movement, till you come with me. Kitty started, her eyes riveted to his. And yet go I will. Not even you shall stop me, Kitty. I'll take the help I've gathered back to those poor devils, if I die for it. But you'll come with me. You'll come. She drew back, trembling under an impression she strove to conceal. If you will talk such madness, I can't help it, she said with a shortened breath. Yes, you'll come, he said, nodding. What have you to do with Ash, Kitty, any longer? You and he are already divided. You've tried life together, and what have you made of it? You're not fit for this mincing, tripping London life, nor am I. And as for morals, I'll tell you a strange thing, Kitty. He bent forward and grasped her hands with a force which hurt, from which she could not release herself. I believe, yes, by God, I believe, that I am a better man than I was before I started on this adventure. It's been like drinking at last at the very source of life, living, not talking about it. One bitter night last February, for instance, I helped a man, one of the insurgents, who had taken to the mountains with his wife and children, to carry his wife, a dying woman, 
over a mountain pass to the only place where she could possibly get help and shelter. We carried her on a litter, six men taking turns. The cold and the fatigue were such that I shudder now when I think of it. Yet at the end I, I seemed to myself a man reborn. I was happier than I'd ever been in my life. Some mystic virtue had flowed into me. Among those men and women, instead of being the selfish beast I've been all these years, I can forget myself. Death seems nothing. Brotherhood, liberty, everything. And yet... His face relaxed, became ironical, reflective. But he held the hands close, his grasp on them hidden by the folds of fur which hung about her. And yet I can say to you without a qualm, put this marriage which has already come to naught between you and come with me. Ash cramps you, he, he blames you, and you blame yourself. Reality has all that. It, it makes you miserable. It wastes life. I accept your nature. I don't ask you to be anything else than yourself, your wild, vain, adorable self. Ash asks you to put restraint on yourself, to make painful efforts to be good for his sake, the sake of something outside. I say, come and look at the elemental things, death and battle, hatred, solitude, love. They'll sweep us out of ourselves. No need to strive and cry for it, into the great current of the world's being, bring us close to the forces at the root of things, the forces which create and destroy. Dip your heart into that stream, Kitty, and feel it grow in your breast. Take a nurse's dress, put your hand in mine and come. I can't promise you luxuries or ease, you've had enough of those. Come and open another door in the house of life. Take starving women and hunted children into your arms. Feel with them, weep with them, look with them into the face of death. Make friends with nature, with rocks, forests, torrents, with night and dawn, which you've never seen, Kitty. They'll love you, they'll support you, the rough people, and the dark forests. They'll, they'll draw nature's glamour round you, they'll pour her balm into your soul. And I shall be with you, beside you, your guardian, your lover, your lover, Kitty till death us do part. He looked at her with the smile which was his only but sufficient beauty. The violent, exciting words flowed in her ear amid the sound of rising waves and the distant talk of the fisherman. His hand crushed hers. His mad, imploring eyes repelled and constrained her. The wild hungers and curiosities of her being rushed to meet him. She heard the echo of her own words to Ash. More life! Or life, even though it leads to pain and agony and tears. Then she wrenched herself away, suddenly, contemptuously. Of course that's all nonsense, romantic nonsense. You've perhaps forgotten that I am one of the women who don't stir without their maid. Cliff's expression changed. He thrust his hands into his pockets. Oh, well, if you must have a maid, he said dryly, that settles it maid would be the deuce. And yet, uh, I think I could find you a Bosnian girl, strong and faithful. Their eyes met, his already full of a kind of ownership, tender, confident, humorous even. Hers alive with passionate anger and resistance. Without a qualm, she repeated in a low voice, without a qualm, want you? She turned and looked towards the Adriatic. Where are we? she would said imperiously. For a gesture of command on Cliff's part, unseen by her, had sent the boat eastward, spinning before the wind. The lagoon was no longer tranquil. It was covered with small waves, and the roar of the outer sea, though still far off, was already in their ears. The mist lifting showed white, distant crests of foam on a tumbling field of water, and to the north closed in tempestuous purple the dim shapes of mountains. Kitty raised herself and beckoned towards the captain of the Bragozzo. Giuseppe, commanda, eccellenza. The man came forward. With a voice sharp and clear, she gave the order to return at once to Venice. Cliff watched her, the veins on his forehead swelling. She knew that he debated with himself whether he should give a counter-order or no. A Venezia, said Kitty, waving her hand towards the sailors her eyes shining under the tangle of her hair. 
the helm was put round, and beneath a tacking sail the boat swept southward. With an awkward laugh, Cliff fell back into his seat, stretching his long limbs across the boat. He had spoken under a strong and genuine impulse. His passion for her had made enormous strides in those few wild days beside her. And yet the fantastic poet's sense responded at a touch to the new impression. He shook off the heroic mood as he doffed his Bosnian cloak. In a few minutes, though the heightened colour remained, he was chatting and laughing as though nothing had happened. She, exhausted physically and morally by her conflict with him, hardly spoke on the way home. He entertained her, watching her all the time, a hundred speculations about her passing through his brain. He understood perfectly how the insight which she had allowed him into her grief and her remorse had broken down the barriers between them. Her incapacity for silence and reticence had undone her. Was he a villain to have taken advantage of it? Why? With a strange, half-cynical clearness, he saw her as the obstacle that she was in Ash's life and career. For Ash, supposing he, Cliff, persuaded her, there would be no doubt a first shock of wrath and pain, then a sense of deliverance. For her, too, deliverance. It excited his artist's sense to think of all the future developments through which he might carry that eager, plastic nature. There would be a new kitty, with new capacities and powers. Was that justification enough? He felt himself a sculptor in the very substance of life, moulding a living creature afresh, disengaging it from harsh and hindering conditions. What was the vile in that? The argument pursued itself. The modern judges for himself makes his own laws as a god, knowing good and evil. No doubt in time a new social law will emerge with new sanctions. Meanwhile, here we are, in a moment of transition, manufacturing new types, exploring new combinations, by which let those who come after profit. Little, delicate, distinguished thing. Every aspect of her, angry or sweet, sad or willful, delighted his taste and sense. Moreover, she was his deliverance, too, from an ugly and vulgar entanglement of which he was ashamed. He shrank impatiently from memories which every now and then pursued him of the Ricci's coarse beauty and exacting ways. Kitty had just appeared in time. He felt himself rehabilitated in his own eyes. Love may trifle as it pleases with what people call law, but there are certain aesthetic limits not to be transgressed. The Ricci, of course, was wild and thirsting for revenge. Let her! Anxieties far more pressing disturbed him. What if he tempted Kitty to this escapade, and the rough life killed her? He saw clearly how frail she was. But it was the artificiality of her life, the innumerable burdens of civilization, which had brought her to this. Women were not the weaklings they seemed or believed themselves to be. For many of them, probably for Kitty, a rude and simple life would mean not only fresh mental but fresh physical strength. He'd seen what women could endure for love's or patriotism's sake. Make but appeal to the spirit, the proud and tameless spirit, and how the flesh answered. He knew that his power with Kitty came largely from a certain stoicism, a certain hardness, mingled, as he would prove to her, with a boundless devotion. Let him carry it through without fears, and so enlarge her being and his own. And as to responsibilities beyond, as to their later lives, let time take care of its own births. For the modern determinist of Cliff's type, there is no responsibility. He waits on life, following where it leads, rejoicing in each new feeling, each fresh reaction of consciousness on experience, and so links his fatalist belief to that Nietzsche doctrine of self-development at all costs and the coming man, in which Cliff's thought anticipated the years. Kitty, meanwhile, listened to his intermittent talk of Venice or Bosnia, with all its suggestions of new worlds and far horizons, and scarcely said a word. But through the background of the brain there floated with her, as with him, a procession of unspoken thoughts. 
She had received three letters from William. Immediately on his arrival, he had attended his resignation. Lord Parham had asked him to suspend the matter for ten days. Only the pressure of his friends, it seemed, and the consternation of his party, had wrung from Ash a reluctant consent. Meanwhile, all copies of the book had been bought up. The important newspapers had readily lent themselves to the suppression of the affair. Private wraths had been dealt with by conciliatory lawyers. And in general, a far more complete hushing up had been attained than Ash had ever imagined possible. There was no doubt infinite gossip in the country houses. But sympathy for Kitty in her grief, for Ash himself and Lady Tramwell, had done much to keep it within bounds. The little Dean, especially beloved of all the world, had been incessantly active on behalf of peace and oblivion. All this Kitty read or guessed from William's letters. After all, then, the harm had not been so great. Why such a panic, such a hurry to leave her, when she was ill, and sorry? And now, how curtly, how measuredly he wrote. Behind the hopefulness of his tone, she read the humiliation and soreness of his mind, and said to herself, with a more headlong conviction than ever, that he would never forgive her. No, never. And especially now that she would added a thousandfold to the original offence. She had never written to him since his departure. Margaret French, too, was angry with her, and almost broken with her. They left their boat on the river and walked to the piazza through the now starry dusk. As they passed the great door of St Mark's, two persons came out of the church. Kitty recognised Mary Lister and Sir Richard. She bowed slightly. Sir Richard put his hand to his hat in a flurried way, but Mary, looking them both in the face, passed without the smallest sign, unless the scorn in face and bearing might pass for recognition. Kitty gasped. She cut me, she said in a shaking voice. Oh no, said Cliff, she didn't see you in the dark. Kitty made no reply. She hurried along the northern side of the piazza, avoiding the groups which were gathered in the sunset light round the flocks of feeding pigeons, brushing past the tables in front of the cafes, still well filled on this mild evening. Take care, said Cliff suddenly, in a low, imperative voice. Kitty looked up. In her abstraction she thought that she had nearly come into collision with a woman sitting at a café table and surrounded by a noisy group of men. With a painful start, Kitty perceived the mocking eyes of Mademoiselle Ricci. The Ricci said something in Italian, staring the while at the English lady, and the men near her laughed, some furtively, some loudly. Cliff's face set. Walk quickly, he said in her ear, hurrying her past. When they had reached one of the narrow streets behind the piazza, Kitty looked at him, white and haughtily tremulous. What did that mean? Why should you deign to ask? was Cliff's impatient reply. I have ceased to go and see her. I suppose she guesses why. I will have no rivalry with Mademoiselle Ricci, cried Kitty. You can't help it, said Cliff calmly. The powers of light are always in rivalry with the powers of darkness. And without further pleading or excuse, he stalked on, his gaunt form and striking head towering above the crowded pavement. Kitty followed him with difficulty, conscious of a magnetism and a force against which she struggled in vain. About a week afterwards, Kitty shut herself up one evening in her room to write to, to Ash. She had just passed through an agitating conversation with Margaret French, who had announced her intention of returning to England at once, alone, if Kitty would not accompany her. Kitty's hands were trembling as she began to write. I am glad, oh so glad, William, that you have withdrawn your resignation, that people have come forward so splendidly and made you withdraw it, that Lord Parham is behaving decently, and that you've been able to get hold of all those copies of the book. I always hoped it would not be quite so bad as you thought, but I know you must have gone through an awful time, and I'm sorry. William, I want to tell you something, for I can't go on lying to you, or even just hiding the truth. I met Geoffrey Cliff here before you left her, and I never told you. I saw him first in a gondola the night of the Serenata. 
and then at the Armenian convent. Do you remember my hurrying you and Margaret into the garden? That was to escape meeting him. And that same afternoon when I was in the unused rooms of the Palazzo Vercelli, the rooms they showed to Taurus, he suddenly appeared and somehow I spoke to him, though I had never meant to do so again. Then, when you left me, I met him again that afternoon and he found out I was very miserable and made me tell him everything. I know I had no right to do so. They were your secrets as well as mine. But you know how little I could control myself. It's wretched, but it's true. William, I don't know what will happen. I can't make out from Margaret whether she's written to you or not. She won't tell me. If she has, this letter will not be much news to you. But mind, I write it of my own free will and not because Margaret may have forced my hand. I should have written it anyway. Poor old darling. She thinks me mad and bad, and tonight she tells me she can't take the responsibility of looking after me any longer. Women like her can never understand creatures like me, and I don't want her to. She's a dear saint, and as true as steel. It's not like your Mary Listers. I could go on my knees to her, but she can't control or save me. Not even you could, William. You've tried your best, and in spite of you, I'm going to petition, and I can't stop myself. For, William, there's something broken forever between you and me. I know it was I who did the wrong, and that you had no choice but to leave me when you did. But yet you did leave me, though I implored you not. And I know very well that you don't love me as you used to. Why should you? And that you can never love me in the same way again. Every letter you write tells me that. And though I have deserved it all, I, I can't bear it. When I think of coming home to England and how you would try to be nice to me, how good and dear and magnanimous you would be, and what a beast I should feel, I want to drown myself and have done. It all seems to me so hopeless. It is my own nature, the stuff out of which I am cut, that's all wrong. I may promise my breath away that I will be discreet and gentle and well-behaved, that I'll behave properly to people like Roy E. Powerham, that I'll keep secrets and, and not make absurd friendships with absurd people, that I'll try and keep out of debt and so on. But what's the use? It's the will in me. There's something that drives, or ought to drive, that won't work. But nobody ever taught me or showed me that I can remember, till I met you. In Paris at the Place Vendôme, half the time I used to live with Maman and Papa, be hideously spoiled, dressed absurdly, eat off silver plate, make myself sick with rich things. And then for days together, Maman would go out or away, forget all about me. I used to storm the kitchen for food. She either neglected me or made a show of me. She was my worst enemy, and I hated and fought her till I went to the convent at ten. When I was fourteen, Maman asked a doctor about me. He said I should probably go mad and that the convent they thought the same. Mamma used to throw this at me when she was cross with me. Well, I don't repeat this to make you excuse me and think better of me. It's all too late for that. But because I am such a puzzle to myself, and I try to explain things. I did love you, William. I believe I do still. But when I think of our living together again, my arms drop by my side and I feel like a dead creature. Your life is too great a thing for me. Why should I spoil or hamper it? If you loved me as you did once, if you still thought everything worthwhile, then, if I had a spark of decency left, I might kill myself to free you, but I should never do what I may do now. But, William, you'll forget me soon. You'll pass great laws and make great speeches, and the years when I tormented you and all my wretched ways will seem such a small, small thing. Geoffrey says he loves me, and I think he does, though how long it will last or may be worth, no one can tell. As for me, I don't know whether I love him. I have no illusion about him. But there are moments when he absolutely holds me, when my will is like wax in his hands. It is because I think of a certain grandness, grandeur seems too strong, in his character. It was always there because no one could write such poems as his without it. But now it's more marked, 
but I don't know that it makes him a better man. He thinks it does, but we all deceive ourselves. At any rate, he is often superb, and I feel that I could die, if not for him, at least with him. And he's not unlikely to die, but in some heroic way. He went out, as you know, simply as correspondent and to distribute relief. But lately he's been fighting for these people. Of course he has. And when he goes back, he used to be one of their regular leaders. When he talks of it, he is noble, transformed. It reminds me of Barham, his wicked life here, and then his death at Missolonghi. Geoffrey could do such base, cruel things, and yet... But I haven't yet told you. He asked me to go with him back to the fighting lines in Upper Bosnia. There seems to be a great deal that women can do. I shall wear a nurse's uniform and probably nurse at a little hospital he founded, high up in one of the mountain valleys. I know this will almost make you laugh. You will think of me not knowing how to put on a button without blanche and waiting to be waited on every moment. But you'll see, there'll be nothing of that sort. I wonder if it's hardship I've been thirsting for all my life, even when I seem such a selfish, luxurious little ape. At the same time, I think it will kill me, and that will be the best end of all, to have some great heroic experience and then cease upon the midnight with no pain. Oh, if I thought you'd care very, very much, I should have pain, horrible pain, but I know you won't. Politics has taken my place. Think of me sometimes, as I was when we were first married, and of Harry, my little, little fellow. Mamma and I have had a ghastly scene. She came to scold me for my behaviour, to say I was the talk of Venice. She! Of course I know what she means. She thinks if I am divorced, she will lose her allowance. And she can't bear the thought of that, though Markham Warrington is quite rich. My heart just boiled within me. I tell her it is the poison of her life that works in me, and that whatever I do, she has no right to reproach me. Then she cried, and her eye was like ice. At last she went. Warrington, good fellow, has written to me and asked to see me. But what is the use? I know you'll leave me the five hundred pounds a year that was settled on me. It'll be so good for me to be poor, and dressed in serge, trying to do something else with these useless hands and writing books that break your heart. I'm giving away all my smart clothes. Blanche is going home. Oh, William, William, I'm going to shut this, and it's like the goodbye of death, and me, an ugly death. Later. They just brought me a note from Danny Ellis. So Margaret did write to you, and your mother has come. Why did you send her, William? She doesn't love me, and I should only stab and hurt her. Though I'll try not, for your sake. Two days later, Ash received almost by the same post which brought him the letter from Kitty, just quoted, the following letter from his mother. My dearest William, I have seen Kitty. With some difficulty she consented to let me go and see her yesterday evening about nine o'clock. I arrived between six and seven, having travelled straight through without a break, except for an hour or two at Milan, and immediately on arriving I sent a note to Margaret French. She came in great distress, having just had a fresh scene with Kitty. Ah, oh, my dear William, her report could not well be worse. Since she wrote to us, Kitty seems to have thrown over all precautions. They used to meet in churches or galleries and go out for long days in the gondola or, or a fishing boat together. And Kitty would come home alone and lie on the sofa through the evening, almost without speaking or moving. But lately he comes in with her and stays hours, reading to her or holding her hand or talking to her in a low voice. And Margaret cannot stop it. Yes, she has done her best, poor girl. Knowing what we all knew last year, it filled her with terror when she first discovered that he was in Venice and that they had met. But it was not till it had gone on about a week, with the strangerous results on Kitty's spirits and nerves, that she felt she must interfere. She not only spoke to Kitty, but she spoke and wrote to him in a very firm, dignified way. Kitty took no notice, only became very silent and secretive. And he treated poor Margaret with a kind of courteous irony, which made her blood boil, 
and against which she could do nothing. She says that Kitty seems to her sometimes like a person moving in sleep, only half conscious of what she is doing, and at others she is wildly excitable, irritable with everybody, and only calming down and becoming reasonable when this man appears. There is much talk in Venice. They seem to have been seen together by various London friends who knew about the difficulties last year. And then, of course, everybody is aware that you are not here. And the whole story of the book goes from mouth to mouth. People say that a separation has been arranged, and, and so on. These are the kinds of rumours that Margaret hears, especially from Mary Lister, who is staying in this hotel with her father, and seems to have a good many friends here. Dearest William, I've been lingering on these things because it is so hard to have to tell you what passed between me and Kitty. Oh, my dear, dear son, take courage. Even now everything is not lost. Her conscience may awaken at the last moment. This bad man may abandon his pursuit of her. I may still succeed in bringing her back to you. But I'm in terrible fear. And I must tell you the whole truth. Kitty received me alone. The room was very dark, only one lamp that gave a bad light, so that I saw her very indistinctly. She was in black, and as far as I could see, extremely pale and weary. And what struck me painfully was her haggard, careless look. All the little details of her dress and hair seemed so neglected. Blanche says she is far too irritable and impatient in the mornings to let her hair be done, as usual. She just rolls it into one big knot herself and puts a comb in it. She wears the simplest clothes and changes as little as possible. She says she's soon going to have done with all that kind of thing, and she must get used to it. My own impression is that she's going through great agony of mind. Above all, that she is ill. Ill in body and soul. She told me quite calmly, however, that she's made up her mind to leave you. She said that she had written to you to tell you so. I asked her, if it was because she had ceased to love you. After a pause, she said, no. Was it because someone else had come between you? She threw up her head proudly and said it was best to be quite plain and frank. She had met Geoffrey Cliff again, and she meant henceforward to share his life. Then she went into the wildest dreams about going back with him to the Balkans and nursing in a hospital, and dying, she hopes, of hard work and privations. And all this in a torrent of words and her eyes blazing, with that look in them as though she saw nothing but the scenes of her own imagination. She talked of devotion and of forgetting herself in other people. I could only tell her, of course, that all this sounded to me the most grotesque sophistry and perversion. She was forgetting her first duty, breaking her marriage vow and tearing your knife asunder. She shook her head and said you would soon forget her. If he had loved me, he would never have left me, she said again and again, with a passion I shall never forget. Of course, that made me very angry, and I described what the situation had been when you reached London. Your parents' state of mind, and the consternation caused everywhere by the wretched book. I tried to make her understand what there was at stake. The hopes of all who follow you in the house and the country. The great reforms of which you are the life and soul. Your personal and political honour. I impressed on her the endless trouble and correspondence in which you had been involved, and how meanwhile all your home office and cabinet work had to be carried on as usual, till you decided whether your resignation should be withdrawn or no. She listened with her head on her hands. I think with regard to the book she is most genuinely ashamed and miserable. And yet all the time there is this unreasonable, this monstrous feeling that you should not have left her. As to the scandalous references to private persons, she said that Madeleine Alcott had written to her about the country house gossip. That wretched being, Mr. Darrell, seemed also to have written to her, trying to save himself through her. And the only time I saw her laugh was when she spoke of having had a furious lady from Lady Graceville about the references to Graceville Park. It was like the laugh of a mischievous, unhappy child. Then we came back to the main matter and I implored her to let me take her home. First I gave her your letter. She read it, flushed up and threw it away from her. He commands me, she said fiercely, but I am no one's chattel. 
I replied that you'd only summoned her back to her duty at her home. And I asked her if she could really mean to repay your unfailing love by bringing anguish and dishonour upon you. She sat dumb, and her stubbornness moved me, so that I fear I lost my self-control and said more, much more, in denunciation of her conduct than I had meant to do. She heard me out, and then she got up and looked at me, very bitterly and strangely. I had never loved her, she said, and so I could not judge her. Always from the beginning I had thought her unfit to be your wife, and she had known it, and my dislike of her, especially during the past year, had made her hard and reckless. It had seemed no use trying. I just wanted her dead, that you might marry a wife who would be a help and not a stumbling block. Well, I should have my wish, for she would soon be as good as dead, both to you and to me. All this hurt me deeply, and I could not restrain myself from crying. I felt so helpless, and so doubtful whether I had not done more harm than good. Then she softened a little, and asked me to let her go to bed. She would think it all over, and write to me in the morning. So, my dear William, I can only pray and wait. I am afraid there is but little hope. But God is merciful and strong. He may yet save us all. But whatever happens, remember that you have nothing to reproach yourself with, that you have done all that man could do. I should telegraph to you in the morning to say, Come at all hazards. But that I feel sure all will be settled tomorrow one way or the other. Either Kitty will start with me, or she will go with Geoffrey Cliff. You would do nothing, absolutely nothing. God help us. She seems to have some money, and she told me that she counted on retaining her jointure. On the night following her interview with Lady Terrenmore, Kitty went from one restless, tormented dream into another. But towards morning she fell into one of a different kind. She dreamed she was in a country of great mountains. The peaks were snow-crowned, Vast glaciers filled the chasms on their flanks. Forests of pines clothed the lower sides of the hills, and the fields below were full of spring flowers. She saw a little alpine village and a church with an old and slender campanile. A plain stone building stood by. It seemed to be an inn of the old-fashioned sort, and she entered it. The dinner table was ready in the low-roofed salle à manger and as she sat down to eat, she saw that two other guests were at the same table. She glanced at them, and perceived that one was William, and the other her child, Harry, grown older and transfigured. Instead of the dull and clouded look which had wrung her heart in the old days, against which she had striven patiently and impatiently in vain, the blue eyes were alive with mind and affection. It was as if the child beheld his mother for the first time, and she him. As he recognised her, he gave a cry of joy, waving one hand towards her, while the other he touched his father on the arm. William raised his head. and When he saw his wife, his face changed. He rose from his seat, and drawing the little boy into his arms, he walked away. Kitty saw them disappear into a long passage, indeterminate and dark. The child's face over his father's shoulder was turned in longing towards his mother, and as he was carried away, he stretched out his little hands to her in lamentation. Kitty woke up, bathed in tears. She sprang out of bed and threw the window nearest to her open to the night. The winter night was mild and a full moon sailed the southern sky. Not a sound on the water, not a light in the palaces. A city of ebony and silver, Venice slept in the moonlight. Kitty gathered a cloak and some shawls round her, and sank into a low chair, still crying and half-conscious. At his inn, some few hundred yards away, between her and the piazzetta, was Geoffrey Cliff waking too, making his last preparations. She knew that all his stores were ready, and that he proposed to ship them and the twenty young fellows, Italians and Dalmatians, who were going with him to join the insurgents, that morning, by a boat leaving for Cataro. He himself was to follow twenty-four hours later, and it was his firm and confident expectation that Kitty would go with him, passing as his wife. And indeed Kitty's own arrangements were almost complete, her money in her purse, the clothes she meant to take with her packed in one small trunk, some of the trammelled jewels which she had been recently wearing 
ready to be returned on the morrow to Lady Trammell's keeping. Other jewels which she regarded as her own, together with the remainder of her clothes, put aside, in order to be left in the custody of the landlord of the apartment, till Kitty should claim them again. One more day, which will probably see the departure of Margaret French, one more wrestle with Lady Tramwell, and all the links with the old life would be torn away. A bare, stripped soul, dependent henceforth on Geoffrey Cliff for every crumb of happiness, treading in unknown paths, suffering unknown things, probing unknown passions and excitements. It was so, she saw herself. Not without that corroding double consciousness of the modern, that it was all very interesting, and as such, to be forgiven and admired. Notwithstanding what she had said to Ash, she did believe, with a clinging and desperate faith, that Cliff loved her. Had she really doubted it, her conduct would have been inexplicable, even to herself, and he must have seemed a madman. What else could have induced him to burden himself with a woman on such an errand, and at such a time? She had promised indeed to be his lieutenant and comrade, and to return to Venice if her health should be unequal to the common task. But in spite of the sternness with which he put that task first, a sternness which was one of his chief attractions for Kitty, she knew well that her coming threw a glamour round it which she had never yet possessed, that the passion she had aroused in him, and the triumph of binding her to his fate, possessed him, for the moment at any rate, heart and soul. He had the poet's resources too, and a mind wherewith to organise and govern. She shrank from him still, but she already envisaged the time when her being would sink into and fuse with his, and, like two colliding stars, they would flame together to one fiery death. Thoughts like these ran in her mind, yet all the time she saw the high mountains of her dream, the old inn, the receding face of her child on William's shoulder, and the tears ran down her cheeks. The letter from William that Lady Tramwell had given her lay on a table near. She took it up and lit a candle to read it. Kitty, I bid you come home. I should have started for Venice an hour ago after reading Miss French's letter, but that honour and public duty keep me here. But mother is going, and I implore and command you as your husband to return with her. Oh, Kitty, have I ever failed you? Have I ever been hard with you that you should betray our love like this? Was I hard when we parted a month ago? If it was, forgive me, I was sore pressed. Come home, you poor child, and you shall hear no reproaches from me. I think I have nearly succeeded in undoing your rash work. But what good will that be to me if you are to use my absence for that purpose to bring us both to ruin? Kitty, the grass is not yet green on our child's grave. I was at Haggard last Sunday, and I went over in the dusk to put some flowers upon it. I thought of you without a moment's bitterness, and prayed for us both, if such as I may pray. Then next morning came Miss French's letter. Kitty, have you no heart and no conscience? Will you bring disgrace on that little grave? Will you dig between us the gulf which is irreparable, across which your hand and mine can never touch each other any more? I cannot, and I will not believe it. Come back to me. Come back. She reread it with a melting heart, with deep, shaking sobs. When she first glanced through it, the word command had burned into her proud sense. The rest passed almost unnoticed. Now the very strangeness in it, as coming from William, the strangeness of its grave and deep emotion, held and grappled with her. Suddenly some tension of the whole being seemed to give way. Her head sank back on the chair. She felt herself weak and trembling, yet happy as a soul, newborn into a world of light. Waking dreams passed through her brain in a feverish succession, reversing the dream of the night, images of peace and goodness and reunion. Minutes, hours passed. With the first light, she got up feebly, found ink and paper, and began to write. From Lady Tramwell to William Ash. Oh, my dearest William, at last a gleam of hope. No letter this morning, I was in despair. 
Margaret reported that Kitty refused to see any one, had locked her door, and was writing. Yet no letter came. I made an attempt to see Geoffrey Cliff, who was staying at the Germania, but he refused. He wrote me the most audacious letter to say that an interview could only be very painful, that he and Kitty must decide for themselves, that he was waiting every hour for a final word from Kitty. It rested with her and with her only. Coercion in these matters was no longer possible, and he did not suppose that either you or I would attempt it. And now comes this blessed note, a respite at least. I am going to Verona tonight with Blanche. Please let no one attempt to follow me. I wish to have two days alone, absolutely alone. Wait here. I will write K. Margaret French, too, has just been here. She was almost hysterical with relief and joy, and you know what a calm, self-controlled person she is. But her dear round face has grown white, and her eyes behind her spectacles look as though she has not slept for nights. She says that Kitty will not see her. She sent her a note by Blanche to ask her to settle all the accounts, and told her that she should not say good-bye. It would be too agitating for them both. In two days she should hear. Meanwhile, the maid Blanche is certainly going with Kitty, and the gondola is ordered for the Milan train this evening. 2 p.m. There is one thing that troubles me, and I must confess it. I did not see that across Kitty's letter in the corner was written, Tell nobody about this letter. And Polly Lister happened to be with me when it came. She had been au courant of the whole affair for the last fortnight, that is, as an onlooker. She and Kitty have only met once or twice since Mary reached Venice, but in one way or another she has been extraordinarily well informed. And as I told you, she came to see me directly I arrived and told me all she knew. You know her old friendship for us, William. She has many weaknesses, and of late I have thought her much changed, grown very hard and bitter. But she's always very loyal to you and me, and I could not help betraying my feeling when Kitty's note reached me. Mary came and put her arms round me, and I said to her, Oh, Mary, thank God, she's broken with him. She's going to Verona tonight on the way home. And she kissed me and seemed so glad. And I was very grateful to her for her sympathy, for I'm beginning to feel my age, and this has been rather a strain. But I oughtn't to have told her or anybody. I see, of course, what Kitty meant. It is incredible that Mary should breathe a word, or, or if she did, that it should reach that man. But I've just sent her a note to Danielis to warn her in the strongest way. Beloved son, if indeed we save her, we will be very good to her, you and I. We will remember her bringing her up and her inheritance. I will be more loving, more like Christ. I hope he will forgive me for my harshness in the past. My William, I love you so. God be merciful to you and to your poor Kitty. Will the Signora have her dinner outside or in the salle à manger? The question was addressed to Kitty by a little Italian waiter belonging to the Albergo Sanzino at Verona, who stood bent before her, his white napkin under his arm. Out here, please, and for my maid also. The speaker moved wearily towards the low wall which bounded the foamy Adice and looked across the river. Far away the Alps had looked down on guard and listened under the stars. The citadel on its hill, the houses across the river, were alive with lights. To the left the great medieval bridge rose, a dark, ponderous mass, above the torrents of the Adige. Overhead the little outside restaurant was roofed with twining vine stems from which the leaves had fallen. Coloured lights twinkled among them and on the white tables underneath. The night was mild and still, and a veiled moon was just rising over the town of Juliet. Blanche? Yes, my lady. Bring a chair, Blanche, and come and sit by me. The little maid did as she was told, and Kitty slipped her hand into hers with a long sigh. Are you very tired, my lady? Yes, but don't talk. The two sat silent, clinging to each other. A step on the cobblestones disturbed them. Blanche looked up, and saw a gentleman issuing from a lane which connected the narrow quay whereon stood the old Albergo San Zeno with one of the main streets of Verona. There was a cry from Kitty. The stranger paused, looked, advanced. The little maid rose, half fierce, half frightened. Go, Blanche, go, said Kitty, panting. Go back into the hotel. Not unless your ladyship wishes me to leave you, said the girl firmly. Go at once, Kitty repeated with a peremptory gesture. She herself rose from her seat, 
and with one hand resting on the table awaited the newcomer. Blanche looked at her, hesitated, and went. Geoffrey Cliff came to Kitty's side. As he approached her, his eyes fastened on the loveliness of her attitude, her fair head. In his own expression there was a visionary, fantastic joy. It was the look of the dreamer, who, for once, finds in circumstance of the real, poetry, adequate and overflowing. Kitty, why did you do this? he said to her passionately as he caught her hand. Kitty snatched it away, trembling under his look. She began the answer she had devised while he was crossing the flagged quay towards her. But Cliff paid no heed. He laid a hand on her shoulder, and she sank back powerless into her chair as he bent over her. Cruel, cruel child to play with me so. Did you mean to put me to a last test, or, or did your hard little heart misgive you at the last moment? I cross-examined your landlady. I bribed the servants and the gondoliers. Not a word. They were loyal, or you had paid them better. I went back into my hotel in black despair. Oh, you, you artist, you plotter. Kitty, you shall pay me this some day. There, there on the table all the time lay your little crumpled note. What note, she gasped, what note? Actress, he said with an amused alarm. And cautiously, playfully, lest she should snatch it from him, he unfolded it before her. Without signature and without date, the soiled half-sheet contained this message, written in Italian and in a disguised handwriting. Too many spectators. Come to Verona tonight. K. Kitty looked at it then at the face beside her, infused with a triumphant power and passion. She seemed to shrink upon herself, and her head fell back against one of the supports of the pergola. One of the blue lights from above fell with ghastly effect upon the delicate tilted face and closed eyes. Cliff bent over her in a sharp alarm, and saw that she had faded away. End of Part 4 Chapter 22